Hey you guys, it is your girl Najwa. Welcome back to my channel. I am so glad you're here and I miss you squatties. <laughs> if you're new to this channel, please go ahead, click the like and subscribe button, hit the bell so you know whenever I post a video. Um, so I want to do a special version of story time today. Again, taking it out of the context of just my channel and into the larger discussion of the Sussexes and the coronation and all of this stuff. Um, let's go over to Twitter. So, today is going to be a little bit different. Um, I want to look at the responses, really. Not just the content itself, but the responses to these two posts from Obed Scobie. We in Sexy Squad basically know that Obed Scobie is, you know, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry's sort of de facto or unofficial sort of, um, historian, their writer, he's written books about them and things like that, although I'm, it's my understanding that he doesn't really know them personally. Um, he's proven himself to pretty much be an ally. I think that he definitely sometimes plays both sides, you know, because he is a royal expert, so he's actually one of these royal experts, but I guess he's one of them with some sort of empathy towards the successes, so, you know, I think he's basically on our side, and, um, you know, I'm just absolutely taken aback when I look at how the level of hate that people hold for the successes. It, in particular, Meghan Markle. It really, really blows my mind when I see some of these comments online. You know, and so I just wanted to read through some of these with you guys and and talk about the sort of sentiments that are out there in the world in the air, both positive and good, leading up to the coronation around the successes and stuff. I thought you guys would find that interesting and um, we can just sort of chat about how much anger and hate there is. I feel like displaced anger and hate, honestly, towards the successes. Um, before we get into that, I will make sure to put like in a timeline to skip for a few life updates, inspiration, whatever. So, you guys know that uh, my friend recently passed. If you've been watching this channel for a while, you probably also know that I recently started my... Um, what do you want to say, road towards baptism with the Catholic Church um, for a very, very long time. Well, you know, essentially I grew up Muslim. You know, I went to a private Muslim school, basically just like a Catholic upbringing, but it was just Muslim. And my parents converted from Islam. Um, but I just, my grandmother and my granddad were devout Christians, and I would often as a kid hear my grandma talking about her love for the Savior, and, you know, it just touched something in my heart that Islam didn't. And while Islam gave me this wonderful foundation, and what my parents gave me was just this, like, infallible faith in God, it's something that's really stuck with me my whole life. And honestly, I feel like it makes me the person who I am today, but um, for the longest, the call of Jesus Christ, you know, and this is just my story, this isn't everybody's story, it just was there for me. You know, even, like I mentioned, my husband is atheist, my best friend is atheist, everybody has their beliefs, and there's nothing wrong with that, but just for me and my own personal journey, like, that call was always really, really strong, but for my whole life, especially during my adolescence and my 20s, I was ashamed. I was ashamed to want to discover my path towards Christianism. I was ashamed to want to um, study the Bible and become Christian, and it basically held me back. I mean, I didn't walk, I, I walked into my first church when I was like 19 or 20, and it was a Unitarian Universalist church, and it was, I basically knew for some time that I probably wanted to go towards the Catholic Church. I know that the Catholic Church has the Crusades and, you know, colonization and, and the Vatican and all of this stuff that sort of marks this history. But we have to remember that those were carried out by people. But sort of the essence of the teachings, the Word of God, that was really what called me. And even though I started out with a sort of agnostic, liberal sort of Christianity, like kumbaya, singing African proverbs, doing church and stuff, and, you know, uh, Jewish, one day we sing Jewish music, one day we sing, and it was really great. It was like a really we of the world type approach to sort of like millennial liberal Christianity, but we barely studied scripture from the Bible, and, you know, it just, 
for years I knew, okay, I'm going to need, I'm going to need to do what's best for me. So it wasn't until I think I was 28 years old that I walked into a Catholic church three years ago. And it wasn't until last, this, September of 20, 20, 20, 20 can't talk, September of 2022 that I actually started my catechism course. And I have two amazing mentors who are volunteers for the church in my, in my area. And they um, are amazing. They're amazing. I literally don't know what I would do without them. And they've made this journey such a joy. Like, in French, the, we would say volunteers of the church. We would say the word benevole, le benevole. And if you think about the Latin roots of that word, it's like benevolence. And benevolence, you know, there's, there's a hard thing of translating French directly to English because English is a, a language where things are really wrapped up in an expression, in, in, in an expression, expression, <laughs> I cannot go today, in an expression. Whereas with um, French, things are really wrapped up in a word, you know, and so, and that really has roots in Latin, but a one word can have a lot of meaning behind it, and benevolent is kind of that type of word, you know. If you think back to a part, you know, other Christians who might be watching this, and like I said, I will put in the description where you can just skip ahead. You know, I just thought I might share this with some of you guys who I knew might be interested. Um, when you basically take the word benevol and you think about it, you know, you I, I think to the part in the Bible, I can't remember exactly which, which part it's from, but I'm sure it's from the New Testament. Um where Jesus Christ tells of a parable um, where a shepherd, you know, a shepherd will literally abandon his whole flock to go and get one that is lost and one that can't find its way home. And he'll abandon his whole flock to go and get that sheep and bring it back and bring it back to safety and bring it back to warmth and love. And, you know, these acts, of human kindness that you know the 12 and that Jesus speaks of is sort of like I mean whether you can take things from the Bible in a sense that works for you in your life at all you can at least just take that what these lessons are trying to teach us is that like this is the this is the essence of human kindness you know I feel like inside of us as humans we have this flame that's burning this flame to want to be there for one another, to care for one another, but we can also have this flame of jealousy and anger and um, depression and, and, and violence. And after my friend passed away a month ago, I, I just find it so ironic because, as I mentioned to you guys, I have been talking to him about my, my road to Catholicism and we, we shared some, some fun moments about that and... Um, you know, and then he was just taken away so suddenly. I feel like there was a reason that, you know, I was already on this this spiritual journey that this happened then. Because for a few day, for a few days, guys, I'm I'm gonna be really honest with you. I just it was bad. I couldn't get out of bed. I wasn't eating. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't really drinking. You know, it's like. I was stuck in this grief and then one day I just was like you know what my friend would not want this and so I just had to stop that and um, yeah I had Bible study with my with my mentors you know we had to skip a session and then we came back after I sort of got myself together and um, you know just to talk about it the, the, the Bible can be for from people who I've talked to who are non-believers they often describe their perception of the Bible is that it's like a big comic book, you know, and that it's just really convoluted and they can't really understand it. And I can get that sentiment because it's like really, unless you sit down with it and you listen to what the word is trying to tell you, it can be very, very difficult to understand. I pulled something from today's mass, um, from the gospel, and I wanted to share it with you because it talked to me in the time of this coronation and you know, I read that oath. We talked about this in the last video. That oath really, to me, did not speak to, okay, like, 
I am here for this nation. I'm here for all the shades and colors and tents of people that exist here. I'm here for your service. It's like I didn't hear service. I didn't hear compassion. I didn't even hear human. I didn't I didn't get any of that from that. And it really, really concerned me. So John chapter ten, verse twenty two to thirty. I'm going to read this to you, and then let's just hop into this. But maybe it might speak to you like it spoke to me concerning all this that's going on. So it says, It was the time of the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple, walking up and down in the portico of Solomon. The Jews gathered round him and said, How much longer are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us openly. Jesus replied, I have told you, but you do not believe me. The works I do in my Father's name are my witness. But if you do not believe me, because you are no sheep of mine. Oh, I'm sorry, I messed that up and that's the best part. He says, but you do not believe me, because you are no sheep of mine. Now, at first hearing that you probably think oh well that sounds kind of snobbish you know and I I had that thought when I first read it too but I had to sort of think about it let me continue the sheep that belong to me listen to my voice I know them and they follow me I give them eternal life they will never be lost and no one will ever steal them from my hand the father for what he has given me is greater than anyone, and no one can steal anything from the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. I mean, the whole thing is wonderful, but the sheep part really stood out to me because Jesus often uses this metaphor of, um, I keep thinking in French, le berger, um, the shepherd, the shepherd and his sheep, his flock. And, yeah, sometimes I just, I look at what's going on in the world, especially in my home country. I live in France, but in the U.S. with extremely, extremely far-right evangelicals. They um, can oftentimes be so convinced in their beliefs that, you know, they can't really see past that. They can't really see any other way. And I don't think that that always manifests itself in terrible ways unless it is the most extreme of those cases. But the speaking to sheep, you know, for example, people who really, really just reject any, any kind of, um, What's the word that I want to say? Any kind of, they don't take anything of substance away from the Bible. You know, their ears seem pretty closed. They're like, you know, I'm never going to trust that some man walked on water. That's not my bag, man, whatever. It's the people who really just seem completely unaffected by the wealth of true love and true fulfillment that you can take from the word. I think that they're not they're 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 not those sheep. They they're not listening with that voice. And uh, we had recently went through uh, the Evangile de Saint Mark. Uh, in English, I would say Mark, the Evangelisms of Mark. I think in in <clears throat> the New Testament in English is called um, Mark. I think it's just called Mark. And there's that part where the King Herod orders John, John the Baptist to be decapitated. And it's because of his wife, who was also the wife of his brother, um, which John the Baptist really, really advocated towards him. That, that's the sin. You can't marry your brother's husband. Uh, you can't marry your brother's wife. She wanted him dead. Herod didn't really want him dead, but she wanted him dead. And so he did it for her and to not seem weak in the eyes of his people. I have looked at that and looked at that in comparison with, um, you know, this sheep, this sheep statement from John. And it's true. People will often really close their ears off 
hey, look, let me just finish by saying this. You know, if Christianism is not for you, I totally understand that. But the teachings in there, I think oftentimes people might be um, a little bit closed and guarded that they can't look past a label that this is Christianism to see the sort of nuggets of wisdom in there. If you want to use another, you know, I've studied so many things just because I feel like I really am a student of the world. If you study Buddhism, um, Om Mani Padmi Hom, you know, that's the Buddhist mantra that you chant when you meditate. For you guys who ever saw the Tina Turner movie, you probably remember her going, Om Mani Padmi Hom, Om Mani Padmi Hom. And that literal translation means the diamond is in the eye of the lotus. It's really, really beautiful and metaphoric. And I know this is getting really, really philosophical, but I felt like I just had to give this little moment of inspiration. Feel free to skip ahead if you don't want to, uh, if you want to just know what's going on with this Twitter thing. But each, each syllable also means a certain thing. Something means perseverance, something means strength, something means patience. Um, but if you want to take anything away, the diamond in the eye of the lotus is basically like sometimes wisdom is hidden. You know, sometimes love and compassion, unity, solidarity is hidden. And you kind of have to go through it to find that nugget of wisdom. So, um, yeah, that gave me great comfort. And it continues to put me on my, my path to be a student of life, to continue to go towards my Lord and Savior, towards the Holy Spirit, and enrich in my connection with God. And I'm not going to say that it's not always going to put a little pang of guilt or, or, or sadness in me because everybody doesn't see the beauty in the word as much as I do. But it still gives me great comfort at the end of the day. And we can always pray. You know, the world can just spin out of control and we can pray. Um, so let's look at some of this Twitter stuff, guys. So I'm opening it up. So Omid Scobie, I got two tweets here. I'm going to start with, no, I'm not going to start with that one. This one is concerning the oath. <laughs> oh, that oath is so, so bad. But we're going to come back to that one. Um, I think this first one was around Megan's statement. Yes. So he, sure, he shared a, an article from Harper's Bazaar. Um, and the article was entitled, Meghan Markle Responds to Rumors About Her Letter, her letter to, King, to King Charles. And I'm just going to read to you some of the quotes that, the, that stuck out to me in the, um, in, the, in the comment section. So this is an example of the people who commented with support. So someone said, I'm glad she has responded in this way. Because it's absolutely ridiculous. The British press slash people cannot understand or believe that Megan's over it now. She's back home where she belongs with her husband and children and she's <clears throat> moving on. So period should period they exclamation point hash uh, at royal family. So I love that. Um, so for example this is a deranger comment. So someone said the most beautiful in, uh, photos on the internet today and they shared some photos of Princess Kate with it looks like it says let this photo of our dearest prince HRH Prince Louis of Wales bring us all uh, much love and light today. Beautiful pictures but why does it have to be one or the other? Why does it have to be like Meghan Markle has to be miserable for Kate to be super duper happy, you know? Why does the sexuses have to be pushed out of the picture for, you know, the whales, the whales is to come into their own right? You know, I just, I don't understand this eye for eye, tooth for tooth um, sort of cruelty. So somebody else, oh, the same person, so obviously the ranger said, it's not rumors. She leaked the existence and content of the letter. Someone else said this was a perfect response. 
And then someone else said, and the royals, clown emoji, apologizing for spreading porkies. Oh my goodness. Now someone commented talking about the carnival of so-called experts, so. Uh, that's funny. Um... <laughs> Somebody said the Meghan Markle to the UK media, keep my name out your nasty mouth. So you see that there, there's like a combination of like this <sighs> condemnation for the two Sussexes, well, for Harry and Meghan, mostly for Meghan as we know and we know why. But there's also like this overwhelming support. You know, and I'm really, really glad that people are speaking up for the successes. Megan is living and thriving, somebody else said. Um, okay. Okay, so here is one of the, this is, this is some of the ones that are really, really, really concerning for me because this to me just shows that people really have been consuming that terrible, corrupt UK media and taking it for truth. So this person says the past impacts of the future and the present. Whether this article appeared or not, the facts remain. The public are looked down on by them. Anything not on the Sussex's agenda is ridiculous, including the wedding, which was just a spectacle for the world. So for me, as someone with some sort of emotional intelligence, when I looked at the documentary on Netflix and I found out that they wanted to do a little wedding, a little ceremony just for them that was separate from the big spectacle of the world, I took their word for it. And I didn't question it, you know? I saw that that was something that they wanted to do for themselves. Why are people, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Like, to me, that just reads something different. You don't have a problem with the successes having a small ceremony on their own. This is something else. Okay. Um, yes. I really wanted to find the one someone commented on her baby bump. And, and I really would like to know what you guys think about this baby bump situation because I really, really can't wrap my head around how this could be anything other than racism. Like, seriously, Kate does not get ridiculed for holding her freaking baby bump. Like, what? Wh how, how on earth do these people actually think that Meghan Markle was able to get by all this time in the public eye with some sort of whoopee cushion or cushion in her under her shirt? You know, it's like... But somebody commented on that, and I can't see it. Oh, somebody says, ended Charles. Simply, simply put, somebody just says, ended Charles. I feel like there's something else with that in there. You know, I feel like people feel like they've got to disparage the Sussexes in order to give Charles a hand up. That's... I just don't see how that works, you know? Like in my recent video, we talked about the address that um, Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth made on her 21st birthday and how that so, sounds so different in verbiage in comparison to the oath that they're taking. Um, the liars of the hashtag racist, racist British media are the palace shot itself. Yes. Now there was another person in the comments, I don't see it here, but they basically said the same thing. The, the palace and their handling of this situation and their handling of these new conversations that we're having in this day and age, they were the ones who shot themselves in the foot, not the Sussexes. <laughs> Somebody commented and said, on Louis's birthday? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, the coronation in, in its entirety got scheduled for Archie's birthday. So, of course, that's... Okay. Um, so, someone says, it makes no sense that the palace leaked these details. It only brings up the accusations levied at them by H and M. It was clearly M.M., Meghan Markle, who leaked this. And now she is backtracking with feigned outrage. Lies. Lies, lies, lies. 
And you know what? Even if her spokesperson did so quote, quote unquote leak this, or in other words, just put it out there for the world transparently, but people people um label this as being leaked bull. Maybe she was just putting her thoughts out there. Why when the other senior royals leak stuff, it's not that big of a deal. It's it's taken as actual um infallible information. I'm I'm not understanding. Mm. Way to go, Megan. That was the perfect response to the trifling British media. They are trying everything to lure her out just to make money off of her, but it won't work. Ouch. And there, this is another one. This one truly gets up under my skin. When people call them the Harkles. First of all, can somebody put in the comments what that even means? Like, let's, like, first of all, it's like so childish. Like, that's what you did when you were like three or four years old. You would call somebody intentionally out of their name. How is this a whole movement made on calling these people? But anyway, what does it mean? What does it mean? I don't know. Um, it's only three to four months ago, Harkles did Netflix reality show, Spare Biography, whinging about their life as royals, trashing the family and the institutions. If they've moved on, give up the title. Everyone knows she's not going to the coronation because their ridiculous demands were not met. She'll be booed. Look at this face. Okay, so the other Twitter. No, she wouldn't be booed. She would get a lot of love. And that would just pain, pain, pain. The poor shriveled up hearts of you know who, and you know who, and you know who, and you know who. So, um... He, Omid Scobie put out another tweet. I think this was on Sunday. And he said, People around the world watching the coronation will be asked to cry out and swear allegiance to the, to the king. With the public given an active role in the ancient ceremony for the first time in history. I was really interested in this because, like I told you guys, that oath just doesn't have any ounce of humanity in it. Any ounce of reverence or love or compassion one subjects um it was really really bizarre to look at so i'm glad that these conversations are being inspired someone says i'm surprised they're not sending that call for allegiance to our phones except or you can't use your phone that right there encapsulates the whole sentiment of this thing it feels like i told you there's a dot 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 at the end of that oath like dot 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 or else it's just Oh, I, 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 yeah, whatever. So, um, someone said, didn't realize he's king of the world. The arrogance is stunning. Middle finger from the world. Black and brown people are not going to swear allegiance to any king. Now, this is where I don't fully agree. From my plunging into the, the internet, the ether spaces of the internet, I've seen a lot of black people and brown people who are monarchists. They exist. Trust me, they exist. Now, you know me, I feel like I don't have too much authority to speak on this subject too much. Like, I'm American, I live in France, I don't live in the UK, so I don't want to be going on too much on rules that don't 100% affect me, but in a global sense, you know, as a collective human sense, it does affect all of us because if these conversations around race relations, around xenophobia, around sexism, and really, really given the the attention and the consideration that they need in the UK. The UK is one of the world's players. I mean, economically, socially, innovative, you know, in innovative sense. Like, if this is happening there, it does affect us on a global scale. So someone said, no, thank you. <laughs> someone said, North Korea, that you? That's so true. Oh my goodness, guys. Someone says, OMG, that sounds like something, sh that sounds like something that should be in The Onion, which is like a satirical newspaper, so clearly not, not taking it too seriously. Someone else said, ouch, I don't know that it's wise for this to be the first coronation where the public gets an active role. 
it is so true. It's like on so many levels, they're so clueless because these are people who aren't thinking with their hearts or from a place of compassion or humanity or service. I... So someone says, is he going to round up and execute anyone who doesn't? How, how, how very Henry VIII of him. Oh my lord. Someone says, in the accompanying Canadian Act, our Parliament will declare Charles the King of Canada, but has notably removed the section calling him Defender of the Faith. Oh, let me click into that one, because I wonder... Mm, someone says, love it good. Somebody else says, thank goodness. Someone else says, calling Charles the defender of the faith that only exists because of the actions of another adulterous king is a bit on the nose. So to my understanding, defender of the faith um, is really coming from the days of like King Arthur and the Round Table. This is like something that is ingrained within the succession of the kings. Um, because if you guys saw the crown, there's that part where they're like, there's a reason you're anointed with holy oil. There's a reason that you're crowned in a church, you know? Like, faith is deeply, deeply wrapped up in the monarchy in the UK, and it comes from those Catholic roots. A lot of it comes from those Catholic roots as well. I think defender of the faith was a beautiful thing, you know, me personally as a person of faith, but I don't see Charles as an extremely spiritual person. So, in a way, maybe that's a positive because people probably take a look at him and think, oh, well, he's more secular, and so that brings people together more. Um, I'm not sure. So someone said, I won't be watching, so moot point. <laughs> Somebody else says, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> someone said, modernizing the monarchy going well, then. That's, that's clearly sarcastic. Um, somebody else said, I'm glad I won't be watching. I'll be too busy celebrating Prince Archie's birthday. And they sent a little gift of, a gif of people partying. Mmm, I love this. So someone says, what needs to happen is that both C and C make a public apology for their gross misconducts during his marriage to Diana and the years after. Ooh, there is no way anyone should pledge allegiance to adulterers, let alone in from any house of God. Ooh, okay, let's just leave it there. Let's just leave it there. Um, final thoughts, final thoughts. Okay, um, generally what I'm seeing is very alarming because what are we? We're, um, three days out, three days out from the coronation, three or four days, and the energy around this thing doesn't really seem to be excitement you know even from people who like that person uh in the other tweet who talked about prince louis may this photo give us comfort on today and blah 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 you know it just like it doesn't even seem like genuine devotion it's like they're scared they're gonna get guillotined <laughs> But guys, let me know what you think in the comments. I would love to hear. Um, like I said, I'm I'm concerned, but at the same time, I'm resting well in my faith that the successes will be protected with sort of this like shield of love and support. There's a lot of people out there clearly that just hate them to hate them. But there's also a lot of people like us out there who support them. So um, the weight, the energy around this coordination is so concerning, you know, and it just points to the fact that they were always right, the successes, they were, they were right from the beginning, and I really, 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 because after this coordination happens, I feel like we will have a further look down the horizon of what things are going to kind of shift into, and maybe it is me being a little naive, a little overly optimistic, but I think that this all of this that's been brewing up for six, seven years, I think it's it's going to eventually start to get to the other senior royals. And maybe, just maybe, it'll make them change their worldview. Because no one is necessarily completely hopeless. <laughs> I have to believe that, you know, the same way that I spoke of in the beginning, you know, with that, with that reading from the scripture. You know, 
I feel like that call, that call of love, of being there for your other human beings, it is very, very, very strong in us. As much as it's strong in us to satisfy those baser human instincts, like jealousy, like anger, like violence, like fury, you know, like power. Um, power can be so corruptive and, you know. So, guys, let me know what you think, and I will see you in the next video. Again, if you're new to this channel, please do me a favor. Go ahead, hit the like and subscribe button, hit the bell so you know whenever I post a video, and I'll see you next time. Okay, bye!